Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. A lot going on this noon. The House Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol insurrection expect to make a big announcement today recommending criminal charges against former President Donald Trump. The committee will hold its final public meeting shortly. ABC News will air a special report. We'll bring that to you live when it happens. But first, a big update this noon. We now know the name of the man killed in a crash on Friday. 64-year-old Randolph Markham Apps of Bernie. According to police, Apps was driving a 1930s model Ford Coupe in a construction area on I-10 where the lanes are uneven. That's when he hit a concrete barrier. He was thrown from the vehicle. Police say the car did not have seat belts, airbags, or modern suspension. Police say the uneven lanes and the lack of safety equipment in the vehicle led to this crash. Officers say this is the third traffic death on I-10 in Bernie just this year. Condolences to his family. You know, it's really important to stay safe on the roads today. Cold, kind of rainy, so hopefully people are driving easy this afternoon. That's right, and I know there's a lot of traffic closures that we're going to get to in a bit, but I mean, Justin, 47 now, it's only going to get colder through the week. Yes, uh, we've got a big cold snap headed our way by Thursday. In the meantime, yes, we're in the 40s right now, probably warming a little bit, maybe to around 50 or low 50s this afternoon as clouds stick around. The rain is starting to move out, so the rain will be out of here soon. We still notice a few showers around San Antonio and a little closer look here at town. Most of this is really beginning to move out. So yes, the, the rain is pretty much over with. We noticed a few showers out around Seguin, Luling, and some heavier rain as you work north and west. LaGrange, still seeing a few lightning strikes there. Schulenburg, Howitzville, you'll have some rain for another couple of hours before this all moves east of us by tonight. And as we look at temperatures, 48 degrees at the airport, 47, Holotus, 45, Burning Stage, 47 in comfort. Still a pretty chilly day, and we don't think temperatures will warm that much. 50 by 3 o'clock, 51, 4 p.m. Maybe a little bit of clearing as we get into this evening, but fog develops by tomorrow morning. Could be kind of a foggy start to your Tuesday uh, with temperatures uh, starting off in the 40s tomorrow. Uh, very quickly, we got to talk about the cold air potential that heads our way Thursday. We're expecting that to arrive by Thursday midday as it does temperatures plunge. We're expecting teens by Friday morning. Very, very cold, but I'll say this is not going to be like February 2021 where we had four and a half days of freezing. Uh, we're not expecting any frozen precip. The sun will be out and temperatures will be in the teens. Yes, but not as cold as it was back then. So this is going to be a cold snap, but we don't need to worry too much. We have much more about the cold snap on our website, ksat.com. Guys. Thank you, Justin. Well, as police tell us, two teens and a gun adding up to dangerous trouble. They say one shot the other while playing with the weapon inside of a West Side apartment. As Katrina Weber shows us, police are still treating this case as a crime. From the scene outside, patrol cars and flashing lights, it is clear there's trouble inside an apartment in the 7200 block of Marbach Road. Police say it had to do with two teens, 16 and 17 year old boys, and a gun apparently in the wrong hands. A police report says when officers arrived around midnight, they found the younger boy with a gunshot wound in his chest. It says they also found the 17-year-old there, telling them the shooting was an accident. Police say he told them the victim was his friend and he didn't mean to shoot him. He says he didn't think the gun was loaded when he pulled the trigger. The 16-year-old was rushed to a hospital and at last check was in serious condition. Police took the other teen into custody. Although what happened here may have been an accident, police say that doesn't mean there won't be consequences. And they say right now the teen who allegedly did the shooting is facing criminal charges. Reporting from the West Side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Katrina. 13 years after a San Antonio teenager, Paul DeLeon, was murdered on the city's east side, police are still trying to figure out who was responsible. So take a look on your screen, a picture of Paul De Leon. Now here's what police know about this case so far. Just after one in the morning on December 19th, 2009, De Leon was in the front passenger seat of a car. Now the car he was in pulled up to the intersection of Fair Avenue and New Braunfels on the city's east side. At that intersection, a white Nissan Frontier pickup truck. Police say someone in that truck pointed a shotgun at the vehicle that De Leon was in. A single shot was fired. He was hit and killed by that gunshot. Whoever was in that truck took off and police are still left with questions about who is responsible. If you know anything that can help officers with the case, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers. That number is 210-224-STOP.
and a scary night for a handful of people on the city's northeast side of town. They were forced to evacuate from their apartment complex after flames broke out. So this was the scene just after midnight at the cottages of Terrell Hills and Harry Warsbach, not too far from Riddleman Road. Crews on the scene telling us fire was showing from the second floor of the building via buses were sent to the scene for anyone who lived there to get out of the cold weather. Now, firefighters tell us they were able to get the flames knocked down quickly. No injuries reported. Still not clear what exactly sparked the flames or how much damage will cost. In his first sit down since taking over the Uvalde CISD Police Department interim chief Josh Gutierrez says he is focused on rebuilding. The entire department was suspended in October. Now Gutierrez says they're in the hiring phase to bring in six to nine new officers. Gutierrez says he is here for the community, students and staff. Now when this tragedy happened at Rob, Gutierrez says he felt called to come to Uvalde and help. I have the abilities to come out here and help the community heal, help our community heal, and the abilities to reestablish a good foundation for our police department. He says he wants to set the standard of what a school-based law enforcement agency looks like. Gutierrez explains that includes tactical cross-training with other local law enforcement, as well as student and community engagement. Gutierrez comes with almost 22 years of school-based law enforcement training. He previously worked at <coughs> East Central ISD and Lavernia ISD. Safety is on the forefront for those UCISD families. Tonight at 6 p.m., the district will have its monthly school board meeting where the interim superintendent will present the end-of-year safety and security report as well as deliver information about the Texas School Safety Center's intruder detection audit. Well, whether you're traveling near or far, a lot of folks hitting the road this week, spending time with loved ones for the holidays. So if you're planning your routes, there are some important closures you have to keep in mind. Traffic Authority Stephen Cavazos helps navigate around these roadblocks. Well, the holidays are here, but despite that, we're still going to see some work take place along our roadways. So let's get you prepared. Find out what closures to be on the lookout for, maybe what places to avoid. 35 over on the northeast side of San Antonio, we will continue to see drilling work on Monday, December 19th. That begins overnight, 9 in the evening to 5 in the morning. Uh, here's what we'll see. I-35 southbound of the northbound turnaround closure at Thousand Oaks Drive will be closed there. But let's take another jump right over here to Loop 1604 on the northeast side, where we will see striping and barrier work take place. Now, now that's actually been ongoing since Sunday, December 18th, and a portion of it will wrap up on Wednesday, December 21st. Keep in mind, it is overnight, so late night owls, early bird commuters, 9 in the evening and 5 in the morning is when you'll see alternating lane closures on the main lanes of Loop 1604 eastbound from Nacogdoches Road to I-35. Let's take one last jump right over here to State Highway 46 for our friends in Comal County. Striping operations will continue from Sunday, December 18th. All right, thank you, Stephen. You can find all that information on KSAT.com. We do want to turn to the January 6th committee with possible recommendations right now. We're going to. The winner swears an oath and upholds it. Those who come up short ultimately accept the results and abide by the rule of law. That faith in our system is the foundation of American democracy. If the faith is broken, so is our democracy. Donald Trump broke that faith. He lost the 2020 election and knew it. But he chose to try to stay in office through a multi-part scheme to overturn the results and block the transfer of power. In the end, he summoned a mob to Washington and knowingly they were armed and angry, pointed them to the Capitol and told them to fight like hell. There's no doubt about this. This afternoon, my colleagues will present our key findings, reminding you of some of the information we presented in earlier hearings and telling you how it fits in our broader conclusions. Those conclusions have helped shape the committee's final report, which we'll adopt today pursuant to House Resolution 503 which establishes the select committee nearly a year and a half ago. I expect our found work will be filed with the clerk of the house and made public later this week. Beyond that release, the select committee intends to make public the bulk of its non-sensitive records before the end of the year. These transcripts and documents will allow the American people 
to see for themselves the body of evidence we've gathered and continue to explore the information that has led us to our conclusions. This committee is nearing the end of its work. But as the country, we remain in strange and uncharted waters. We've never had a president of the United States stir up a violent attempt to block the transfer of power. I believe nearly two years later, this is still a time of reflection and reckoning. If we are to survive as a nation of laws and democracy, this can never happen again. How do we stop it? This committee will lay out a number of recommendations in this final report. But beyond any specific details and recommendations we present, there's one factor I believe is most important in preventing another January 6th, accountability. So today, beyond our findings, we will also show that evidence we've gathered points to further action beyond the power of this committee or the Congress to help ensure accountability under law. Accountability that can only be found in the criminal justice system. We have every confidence that the work of this committee will help provide a roadmap to justice and that the agencies and institutions responsible for ensuring justice under the law will use the information we've provided to aid in their work. And for those of you who have followed this committee's work, I hope we've helped make clear that there's a broader kind of accountability. Accountability to all of you, the American people. The future of our democracy rests in your hands. It's up to the people of this country to decide who deserves the public trust, who will put fidelity to the Constitution and democracy above all else. Who will abide by the rule of law, no matter the outcome? I'm grateful to the millions of you who followed this committee's work. I hope we lived up to our commitment to present the facts and let the facts speak for themselves. Let me say in closing, the women and men seated around me on this dais are public servants in the most genuine sense. They put aside politics and partisanship to ensure the success of this committee in providing answers to the American people. I especially want to thank and acknowledge our vice chair, who has become a true partner in this bipartisan effort, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming. And I also recognize her for any opening statement that she care to offer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your, your tremendous leadership of this committee. I know we all have benefited uh, greatly from, from your wisdom and your wise counsel, so thank you very much. In April of 1861, when Abraham Lincoln issued the first call for volunteers for the Union Army, my great-great-grandfather, Samuel Fletcher Cheney, joined the 21st Ohio Volunteer Infantry. He fought through all four years of the Civil War, from Chickamauga to Stones River to Atlanta. He marched with his unit in the Grand Review of Troops up Pennsylvania Avenue in May of 1865, past a reviewing stand where President Johnson and General Grant were seated. Silas Canfield, the regimental historian of the 21st Ohio Volunteer Infantry, described the men in the unit this way. He said they had a just appreciation of the value and advantage of free government and the necessity of defending and maintaining it. And they enlisted, prepared to accept all the necessary labors, fatigues, exposures, dangers, and even death for the unity of our nation and the perpetuity of our institutions. I have found myself thinking often, especially since January 6th, of my great-great-grandfather and all those in every generation who have sacrificed so much for the unity of our nation and the perpetuity of our institutions. At the heart of our republic is the guarantee of the peaceful transfer of power. Members of Congress are reminded of this every day as we pass through the Capitol Rotunda. 
There, eight magnificent paintings detail the earliest days of our republic. One, painted by John Trumbull, depicts the moment in 1793 when George Washington resigned his commission, handing control of the Continental Army back to Congress. Trumbull called this, quote, one of the highest moral lessons ever given the world. With this noble act, George Washington established the indispensable example of the peaceful transfer of power in our nation. Standing on the west front of the Capitol in 1981, President Ronald Reagan described it this way. The orderly transfer of authority as called for in the Constitution routinely takes place, as it has for almost two centuries, and few of us stop to think how unique we really are. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four-year ceremony that we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. Every president in our history has defended this orderly transfer of authority, except one. January 6, 2021 was the first time one American president refused his constitutional duty to transfer power peacefully to the next. In our work over the last 18 months, the Select Committee has recognized our obligation to do everything we can to ensure this never happens again. At the beginning of our investigation, we understood that tens of millions of Americans had been persuaded by President Trump that the 2020 election was stolen by overwhelming fraud. And we also knew this was flatly false. We knew that dozens of state and federal judges had addressed and resolved all manner of allegations about the election. Our legal system functioned as it should, but our president would not accept the outcome. Among the most shameful of this committee's findings was that President Trump sat in the dining room off the Oval Office watching the violent riot at the Capitol on television. For hours, he would not issue a public statement instructing his supporters to disperse and leave the Capitol, despite urgent pleas from his White House staff and dozens of others to do so. Members of his family, his White House lawyers, virtually all those around him knew that this simple act was critical. For hours, he would not do it. During this time, law enforcement agents were attacked and seriously injured. The Capitol was invaded, the electoral count was halted, and the lives of those in the Capitol were put at risk. In addition to being unlawful, as described in our report, this was an utter moral failure and a clear dereliction of duty. Evidence of this can be seen in the testimony of President Trump's own White House counsel and several other White House witnesses. No man who would behave that way at that moment in time can ever serve in any position of authority in our nation again. He is unfit for any office. The committee recognizes that our work has only begun. It's only the initial step in addressing President Trump's effort to remain in office illegally. Prosecutors are considering the implications of the conduct that we describe in our report, as are citizens all across our nation. In 1761, John Adams wrote, the very ground of our liberties is the freedom of elections. Faith in our elections and the rule of law is paramount to our republic. Election deniers, those who refuse to accept lawful election results, purposely attack the rule of law and the foundation of our country. The history of our time will show that the bravery of a handful of Americans doing their duty saved us from an even more grave constitutional crisis. Elected officials, election workers, and public servants stood against Donald Trump's corrupt pressure. Many of our committee's witnesses showed selfless patriotism, and their words and courage will be remembered. The brave men and women of the Capitol Police, the Metropolitan Police, and all the other law enforcement officers who fought to defend us that day saved lives and our democracy. Finally, I wish to thank my colleagues on this committee. It has been a tremendous honor to serve with all of you, 
We have accomplished great and important things together, and I hope we have set an example. And I also want to thank all of those who have honorably contributed to the work of our committee and to our report. We have accomplished much over a short period of time. Many of you sacrificed for the good of our nation. You have helped make history, and I hope helped to right the ship. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back. As you know, this is our final meeting of our committee. Over the course of the last year and a half, we presented evidence in 10 public hearings, testimony from our brave law enforcement officers, senior White House, and campaign officials, and many others. Today, we are prepared to share our final findings with you. But before we do so, it's important to remember what we've learned and critically exactly what happened at the United States Capitol on January 6th. Without objection, I include in the record a video presentation of some of the key evidence our investigation has uncovered. There were officers on the ground. They were bleeding. They were throwing up. I, I mean, I saw friends with blood all over their faces. I was slipping in people's blood. As I was swarmed by a violent mob, they ripped off my badge. They grabbed and stripped me of my radio. They seized ammunition that was secured to my body. They began to beat me with their fists and with what felt like hard metal objects. The key thing to do is to claim victory. No, we won. Fuck you. Sorry. Over. We won. Yeah. You're wrong. Fuck you. Right out of the box on election night, the president uh, claimed that there was major fraud underway. I mean, this happened, as far as I could tell, before there was actually any potential of looking at evidence. I didn't think what was happening was necessarily honest or professional at that point in time. So yeah. that led to me stepping away. Generally discussed on that topic was whether the fraud, maladministration, abuse, or irregularities, uh, if aggregated and read most favorably to the campaign, would that be outcome determinative? And um, I think everyone's assessment in the room, at least amongst the staff, Mark Short, myself, and Greg Jacob, was that it was not sufficient to be outcome determinative. I told him that I did believe, yes, that once the, those legal processes were run, uh, if fraud had not been established, that had affected the outcome of the election, then unfortunately I believed that what had to be done was concede the outcome. What were the chances of President Trump winning the election? After that point? Yes. None. So what are we going to do here, folks? I only need 11,000 votes. Fellas. I need 11,000 votes. Give me a break. The numbers are the numbers. The numbers don't lie. We had many allegations, and we investigated every single one of them. Did uh, one of them uh, make a comment that uh, they didn't have evidence, but they had a lot of theories? That was Mr. Giuliani. And, and what exactly did he say, and how that come up? My recollection, he said, we've got lots of theories, we just don't have the evidence. You're asking me to do something that's never been done in history, the history of the United States. And I'm going to put my state through that without sufficient proof. It's a tape earlier in the day of Ruby Freeman and Shay Freeman Moss and one other gentleman quite obviously, surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. In one of the videos we just watched, Mr. Giuliani accused you and your mother of passing some sort of USB drive to each other. Uh, what was your mom actually handing you on that video? A ginger mint. Do you know how it feels to have the president of the United States to target you? The president of the United States is supposed to represent every American not to target one.
I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was bullshit. He wanted to talk about that he thought the uh, the election had been uh, stolen or, or was corrupt and that there was widespread fraud. And I had told him that uh, our reviews had not shown that to be the case. And I said something to the effect of, sir, we've done dozens of investigations, hundreds of interviews. The major allegations are not supported by the evidence developed. Well, my first thought was, where's th this is a, a terrible idea. Jeff Clark cannot be installed as acting attorney general of the United States. You ultimately told us that you described uh, this meeting as a, or, or the, uh, not this meeting, the Georgia letter that was proposed as a an effing murder-suicide pact. Do you remember using the term murder-suicide pact? Yes. Was it your impression that the vice president had directly conveyed his position on these issues to the president, not just to the world through a dear colleague letter, but directly to President Trump? Many times. My view was that the vice president had, didn't have the legal authority to do anything except what he did. And I said, hold on a second, I want to understand what you're saying. You're saying that you believe the vice president acting as president of the Senate can be the sole decision maker as to, under your theory, who becomes the next president of the United States. And he said, yes. And I said, are you out of your effing mind? The president was, you know, all the attention was on uh, what Mike would do or what Mike wouldn't do. There's a telephone conversation between the president and the vice president. Is that correct? Yes. The conversation was, was pretty heated. I apologize for being impolite, but do you remember what she said? Her father called him. The P word. Bring up it. Bring it up. It was clear that it was escalating and escalating quickly. So then when that tweet, the Mike Pence tweet um, was sent out, um, I remember us saying that that was the last thing that needed to be tweeted at that moment. It felt like he was pouring gasoline on the fire by tweeting that. I gained access to the second floor, and I've got public about five feet from me down here below. They copy. They are on the second floor, moving in now. We may want to consider getting out and leaving now. Copy. Uh, members of the BPT tell at this time were starting to fear for their own lives. There were calls to um, say goodbye to family members, so on and so forth. Approximately 40 feet. That's all there was. 40 feet between the vice president and the mob. Donald Trump and his allies and supporters are a clear and present danger to American democracy. We got derogatory information from OSINT suggesting that uh, some very, very violent individuals uh, were organizing uh, to come to D.C. As Mr. Giuliani and I were walking to his vehicles that evening, he looked at me and said something to the effect of, Cass, are you excited for the 6th? It's going to be a great day. I remember looking at him saying, Rudy, could you explain what's, what's happening on the 6th? Uh, he, he had responded something to the effect of, we're going to the Capitol. It's going to be great. The president's going to be there. He's going to look powerful. <laughs> He personally asked for us to come to D.C. that day. And I thought, for everything he's done for us, if this is the only thing he's going to ask of me, I'll do it. Uh, well, basically, uh, you know, the president, you know, got everybody riled up, told everybody to head on down. So we basically were just following what he said. Within 15 minutes of leaving the stage, President Trump knew that the Capitol was besieged and under attack. So are you aware of any phone call by the President of the United States to the Secretary of Defense that day? Not that I'm aware of, no. Are you aware of any phone call by the President of the United States to the Attorney General of the United States that day? No. Are you aware of any phone call by the President of the United States to the Secretary of Homeland Security that day? I, I'm not aware of that, no. 
Did you ever hear the vice president, or excuse me, the president no. ask for the national no. guard? Did you ever hear the president ask for law enforcement response? No. You got an assault going on on the capital of the United States of America. saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. You on the staff did not want people to leave the Capitol. On the staff? I, In the White House. I, I, I don't... I, I can't think of anybody, you know, on that day who didn't want people to get out of the the Capitol once the, you know, particularly once the violence started. No. I mean, it, What about the president? Yeah. Well, she said the staff. So I answered. No, I said in the White House. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I thought you said who, who else on the staff. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't reveal communications, but obviously, I think you know. I said, good, John. Now I'm going to give you the best free legal advice you're ever getting in your life. Get a great FN criminal defense lawyer. You're going to need it. General Flynn, do you believe in the peaceful transition of power in the United States of America? Let's go. Another officer unconscious. The terrorist. What's your I don't want to say the election's over. I just want to say Congress has certified the results without saying the election's over, okay? The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofgren, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the last 18 months, the Select Committee has conducted a congressional investigation of enormous scale, seeking to uncover the depth and breadth of ex-President Trump's multi-part plan to reverse the lawful outcome of the 2020 presidential election. We've compiled an immense volume of documents collected from countless individuals, law enforcement agencies, and federal and state authorities. Many of our efforts to get the evidence required litigation in federal court, including the U.S. Supreme Court. We've taken the testimony of hundreds of witnesses. And while we couldn't show them all during the hearings, we focused on those who were most, most central, including our ex-president's White House aides, his senior Department of Justice officials, and senior members of his campaign. Based on this assembled evidence, the Select Committee has reached a series of specific findings. Now, many of these findings pertain to what has been called the big lie, the enormous effort led by ex-President Trump to spread baseless accusations and misinformation in an attempt to falsely convince tens of millions of Americans that the election had been stolen from him. Beginning even before the election, and continuing through January 6th and thereafter, Donald Trump purposely disseminated false allegations of fraud in order to aid his effort to overturn the 2020 election. 